Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of RPGs with Paddy. I'm Paddy. So today we're starting my Vecna deep dive proper after the brief introduction and the talk about the cult of Vecna. It makes sense to start with his first real appearance, and of course that is with the scenario Vecna Lives. Uh, this was written by David Zeb Cook in 1990, and you can still buy the PDF for about 10 bucks over on Drive Through RPG or DM's Guild. It has not received much praise by people looking into it in the previous years. I'm not sure what the reaction was at the time of its release, as I was too young. I was vaguely aware of the campaign for years, but I never looked into it until recently. Just two things before we begin. The first is that you should probably check out my previous video on the structure of the Cult of Vecna. I'll leave a link in the description. It's not necessary, but it will help clear up a few minor things in, the, in this video. Secondly, if your DM is planning on running the upcoming Vecna uh, Eve of Ruin campaign, you should check with them before watching the video. The campaign has been out for about 35 years, uh, so spoiler warnings are pretty moot. Uh, however, your DM puts a lot of work into their games, so don't ruin it by watching spoilers. On the other hand, your DM might be happy that you're looking into a little bit of lore so that the world building will be more natural for you. Okay, so this is a campaign, so it's a little bit longer than the typical one-shot scenarios I review for Call of Cthulhu. So we're just going to get right into it. Before the scenario begins, we do get an excerpt from the Chronicle of Secret Times, um, which gives us a little bit of information about how powerful, feared, and evil Vecna is, and it introduces his lieutenant, Cass the Hateful. The DM gets some pretty clear instructions from the start that this is a deadly campaign and you will be killing the PCs. Uh, this will be established right from the start, so the players should have a healthy amount of fear. The campaign is described as a horror movie. Um, in modern D&D, that can be quite difficult, especially if you haven't played any RPGs, any horror RPGs before. So I'd recommend checking out advice for systems like Call of Cthulhu, Delta Green, and Cult. Uh, not for the mechanics or scenarios, although they're also great, but for advice on creating and maintaining horror. Vassen from Free League Publishing is horror fantasy, so that might be the most closely related. And the GURP supplement Horror from Steve Jackson Games is pretty good too at how to create that sense of horror. And I think that's a little bit better than just constantly killing off your characters. So we get some background information on Vecna here for the GM. If you don't know, Vecna was an incredibly powerful wizard and he was a strict and cruel ruler, for example using entire villages as breeding grounds for his sadistic magical experiments. He managed to become a lich, uh, in fact he's often called the greatest of all liches. Cass was his lieutenant, or you know, gradually rose through the ranks to become his, his most trusted lieutenant. And where as Vecna's empire grew, any time Vecna couldn't be there in person, Cass would represent him. Vec uh, Vecna created a powerful sword for him called the Sword of Cass. It's an evil sword that eventually convinced Cass to try to dethrone Vecna. They battled, and then Vecna's tower crumbled. All that was left was Vecna's eye, Vecna's hand, which became magical artifacts, and the Sword of Cass. But there was no sign of Cass at all, or the rest of Vecna. Vecna, however, as a lich, you know, is immortal, and with worshippers now he ranks as a demigod. But he wants to be a greater god, something he's been working on for centuries. He's set out key items around Oerth, which is the land of Greyhawk, and once they're all fully powered and connected, the gods will be blocked from Oerth, and Vecna will be the only god there, thus he'll get all the power from all the worshippers there, because they can't worship anyone else. But to complete his mission, he needs his eye and his hand back. Since he was destroyed, the gods have hidden these two artifacts from him. He can only detect them when someone is wielding them and using them. Other than that, they are blocked from any kind of scrying by Vecna. The campaign starts off with the players taking on the roles of members of the Circle of Eight, who were the most powerful spellcasters in all of Greyhawk. The characters will be given uh, pre-generated character sheets that are just incredibly powerful. 
Rari, for example, is a 23rd level uh, mage who knows 8 ninth level spells and, ca and can cast 3 of them a day. So the players should feel pretty powerful. There's some kind of sense of great danger coming to Greyhawk and Mordenkainen, who's the leader of the Circle of Eight, but not one of the eight. He's like a ninth one, and you can't play as him. So he gathers you all in, and he tells you that there's a cairn in the Cron Hills that seems to be connected to the weird magic. The mound itself is where Halmadar the Cruel was buried alive by his followers over a hundred years ago. He came into possession of both the eye and the hand of Vecna, the artifacts, as opposed to the creatures, and became more cruel to that. His followers eventually drugged him and entombed him in this burial mound with very strong enchantments on the mound. But because of the hand and the eye, he didn't die. They kept him alive and he has gone completely mad and he thinks that he's really Vecna. So there's a fairly simple cave that the Circle of Eight will turn up at, and after killing a few basic creatures and removing some of the very powerful magical wards there, they will be met by Halmadar, who will immediately cast Time Stop, uh, you know, which used to be so much more powerful in the earlier versions of of D and D, and he'll basically kill all of the player characters here before they can react at all. It has to be scripted that way, even if it's unfair, unfair to the players. That's just how this campaign was written. They may hear him saying something like, I'm Vecna, you fools have released me, or something along those lines. And that's the end of the prologue. To start the campaign proper, there are pre-generated pre characters provided, each having a connection to one of the Circle of Eight. But you can also use or, or original or existing characters too. Ideally, they would have some kind of connection to the Circle of Eight, even just socially. So each of the new characters get very vague visions from the Circle of Eight member they know, saying something along the lines of, Warn Mordenkainen. So the goal of this chapter for, for the characters is to find a way to communicate with Mordenkainen and tell him something's gone wrong. Maybe give them some vague information that they learned from that. The most obvious way to get in contact with Mordenkainen is to head to the Wizards Guild in Greyhawk, but there's, you know, kind of a roundabout way of doing it here as well. But eventually you'll you'll find someone to act as kind of a telepathic vessel to communicate with Mordenkainen for you. So Mordenkainen, you never meet him in person. In Chapter 2, you'll have the virtual meeting with Mordenkainen. He is not particularly helpful, but he does talk about some partial restrictions uh, that have started with divination magic and suggest three reasons for it. Uh, either some powerful group may be targeting Greyhawk in preparation for a coup. The Secondly, the priests of Greyhawk may have offended the gods and th that's why they're cut off from them. Or third, there's some problem in the, in, in the god sphere that's throwing them into flux and that means that divination is not possible. Mordenkainen also mentions that his current research in the Wizards Guild library has been yielding some interesting results, most notably in the Chronicle of Secret Times. That uh, volume is mentioned at the very start in the pro or before the prologue, just detailing some of the actions of Vecna and Cass. So around this time, once Mordenkainen has said all that's important, a little though there may be, the tavern the PCs are in will come under attack by cultists of Vecna trying to kill the PCs due to their connection to the Circle of Eight. It's a little bit tenuous, but okay. If you want to run this, uh, have a look at a breakdown of my Cult of Vecna for a bit more understanding. But basically, it doesn't really matter if they fight or flee, because either way, they will notice the cultists all have talismans with a hand with an eye in the palm. This will be an unknown symbol to them at this stage. But from here, the next stage is information gathering. You don't have a huge amount to go on apart from what Mordenkainen said and to maybe retrace the steps of the Circle of Eight when they were doing research up uh, that led to them, you know, being killed. So the PCs would best be served trying to find information from the three big libraries in the city, uh, the Wizards Guild, uh, Grey College and the Great Library of Greyhawk. This research will likely lead you to the temples and to the river quarter. What you learn in the libraries depends on 
the faith and alignment of each individual character, which was a much more central part of D&D in the earlier editions. Research will probably reveal three things. The name of the cult, the cult of Vecna, that there are strange rumours from Osnabrolt near the Cron Hills, and that thugs in the River Quarter have been seen wearing that symbol. Now, going to Osnabrolt, and I'll pop up a map here, that's going to take quite some time, and you'll probably need to go to the River Quarter anyway to hire someone to bring you there, so your best course of action is go to the River Quarter. Now, the way information is presented here is not good from the GM's point of view, I think. The module keeps trickling out little bits of information to you, the GM, and that's not how good modules should be written. There shouldn't be surprises for the GM as you read through. The information, the key information should be given up front so you know what's going on as you read through it. The surprises are for the players. Anyway, uh, there are a few key characters here in the River Quarter. Uh, Yagos Slevak is a René, who, who are kind of semi-nomadic gypsies, but he's secretly a cultist of Vecna. Uh, Almarth the Halt is also a René and a secret cultist. Almarth was at the ambush earlier outside of the tavern, and he helped smuggle in the hand and the eye, the creatures, if you've seen my cult uh, structure video, he helped smuggle them into Greyhawk. The leader of the René is Turim Varostak, I think. But actually, he is the avatar of Vecna. He is not a cultist or a member of the cult yet. So th this is where it gets a little bit confusing. So the René are against the cult of, of Vecna in general. But the two main named members here, Yagos and Almarth, are secretly members of the cult. And the leader of the René is actually the avatar of Vecna, but he's not related to the, he's not connected to the cult in any way yet. So he wants to find, Turim wants to find out about the secret cult to dispose of the person who is posing as Vecna, uh, because Turim thinks that person must have the hand and the eye, the artifacts of Vecna, which. Turim, Vecna, the avatar of Vecna, needs those items to become full Vecna and enact his plan to block the gods off from Oer. So, as I mentioned, the René in general are opposed to the evil cult, but they think that it might be active near the somewhere near the, the lake of near Div. If the players start asking around the River Quarter, they will be brought in front of Turim. And if the players can offer him any help in identifying members of the cult, that's good. But, you know, whether they give him information or not, he'll take matters into his own hands anyway, and he will kill Yagos and or Almarth, getting all the information he can from them about the cult, and then he will offer to accompany the party to uh, Verbabonk. If the players manage to talk to Yagos first, he will be eager to lead them into a trap by taking them towards Verbabonk. There's not much else that you can do here, but you do probably need to come here to the River Quarter to meet Turum and or Yagos uh, and to find a way to go to Verbabonk. There are three ways to get here. Uh, Turum can take you on his boat, Yagos can take you on his barge, or you can get a lift with Avril Riskar, who is a noble who owns several boats. If you choose Yagos, who's the secret cultist, after a few days' travel, the crew of cutthroats will tie up the party and dump them into the depths of near Div. The other routes will get you there without much fuss. If the investigators are dragging their feet, trying to gather every last shred of evidence, you as the GM are encouraged to introduce a few things to kind of hurry them up and get them moving on towards Verbabonk. Now, Verbabonk is a city where social class and titles are paramount. And they also recently dealt with two big problems with the Temple of Elemental Evil and the return of the Temple of Elemental Evil. So they're very much against an evil cult. So on the journey, it's not in the uh, campaign at all, but I think on the journey towards Verbabunk is the great uh, time for the players to learn about how to carry themselves in the city. Otherwise, they just won't get anywhere. The leader... You should refer to him as his noble lordship, the Viscount Wilfric of Verbabunk, 
is likely he's likely to be too busy to meet with the players but you'll probably meet with the second most powerful person in the city who is his holiness bishop haufren of saint cuthbert and we'll get into him a little bit later now if you arrive into the city and you're asking about osnabrolt then which is the gnome city which has rumors about some kind of connection to the cult then you'll likely be directed towards Gnomeberg, which is a small gnome enclave within Verbabank. Miral runs an inn there, and she can give them some information about the history of Osnabrolt and can provide a guide to bring them there. The legend goes that a human, missing his hand and his eye, so presumably Vecna, walked into Osnabrolt, and after beating all the gnomes in wrestling, like a friendly contest, he bound them to be protectors of a sword which he thrust into the ground. The crops of the gnome city of the gnome town would wither, but they would become great warriors. So as I mentioned, Miral can provide a guide to get to Osnabrolt, but we will deal with that later though it could be done now. Alternatively, if you arrive and you start openly asking about the cult of Vecna, you will attract the attention of three groups. The cultists, the priests of St. Cuthbert, and the knights of the Viscount. The cultists will send Oaklin, who is a half-elf cultist of Vecna, to befriend the party, eventually trying to lead them into a trap, which we'll get to later. The priests will report to the bishop, who will invite the party to join him to discuss the matter, quite friendly, and the knights will basically arrest them and bring them before the provost of the city, his prominence, Rollo Augustine. The bishop, if he judges the uh, characters, the party, to be morally good, can drop hints directing them towards the inn called the Scythe and Sheaf, and he will also mention the gnome settlement in the Cron Hills, which is Osnabrolt. The provost will imprison them if they're being uncooperative, but he demands to be kept in the loop of anything they find. If they are being cooperative, he will give them a contact, the Right Honourable Sir Alphentrask. And Sir Alphentrask suggests that they check out a number of taverns. He lists a number of kind of places of, of questionable repute. Well, one of them is the Scythe and Sheaf Inn, which the bishop may have mentioned. It's, I'm not sure if you'll see all of these anyway. And Sir Alphen Trask will also mention some mutilations of, I think, animals that recently were found at a quarry outside of town. If you check out the inns, it requires a few nights staying in each one to figure anything out, although players could split up here as well. There are some suggested encounters for all of them, but only the scythe and sheaf leads to anything. Although, does it really? We'll get to it now. So, Yago Slevak who is the René guy who may have brought you here or not, but he can be found here along with the half-elf Oakland. Uh, it says they're talking very seriously and they shake hands at the end. The scenario says if you successfully follow Oakland without being detected, you can uncover the cult, but it doesn't explain how. The secret cult is hiding in the basement of this establishment now, but Oakland walks out of the inn and then you're meant to jump to how you make a raid on the inn. Anyway, but unless you've previously encountered Yagos or Oakland and know them or suspect them of being cultists, none of that makes any sense, to me at least. So let's just assume they don't uh, expose the cult that way. Oakland will try to convince the party to go to the quarry that's been mentioned a few times by now. There are some decent hints on how to play Oakland as not a good guy, but not necessarily evil. He just wants money, so he's sleazy, but not necessarily out to get the party or anything. If you decide to check out the quarry, uh, on your way, you can stop off at an inn that has a friendly innkeeper, and he wants the party to clear up any kind of supernatural talk about the quarry because it's affecting his business. He doesn't think there's any truth to the stories. He also subtly warns the party that Oakland is not to be trusted if Oakland is with them. Anyway, during this time, a local farmer will come in with a story about the quarry, a trail of blood leading there, and he's very scared. But he won't really give any information to the party because they're outsiders. But the innkeeper will urge the party to go now because people have tried going there during the day and have been unable to find anything. This is the rare time when something is happening, so you should go now. 
So after finding their way to the quarry, battling through some uh, raised skeletons, the party will arrive at the quarry with an apparent ritual taking place at the bottom. Several figures stand around a deer on an altar, but the figures are actually just scarecrows and there's a chanting coming, but that's a magical spell used to throw voices. The cult members are actually hidden on the upper layers, various layers of the quarry, waiting to ambush the characters. Once the party gets down to the altar, they'll realize that it's just um, scarecrows there and they will be attacked by vampiric mists who are pretty, pretty bad. The cult will also send in some of the blood of Vecna, the fighters, and some teeth of Vecna, spellcasters, will be firing, you know, magic at them from range. Each tooth of Vecna, so the spellcasters, has a finger, a thief, bodyguard watching so if you go up and you try and attack the spellcasters you'll probably get backstab damage there is also a thought a high priest of vecna who's kind of orchestrating the whole thing but isn't really involved in any attacks just kind of controlling what's going on if the ambush looks like it's failing the spellcasters including the uh, the thought of vecna the priest will escape with spells and the others will attempt to flee through normal means Information can be gathered from any prisoners you capture or using speak with dead spell. Only the thought of Vecna, so the priest, will not betray any information under any circumstances. But the information that can be gleaned is that the quarry was just a trap. The cult doesn't use that at all. They're just trying to lure, you know, curious people out there. Oakland and Yagos are cultists and the cult meets in a secret basement of the Scythe and Sheaf Inn. If the characters lose the ambush, they're left there for the vampiric mist to gradually feed on them, but, you know, this is the whole villains leave you tied up to die, and there's a number of kind of lame deus ex machina solutions to this. So, at this point, the players should be ready for a raid on the Scythe and Sheaf, or at least that's what the adventure assumes. You might have to do, you as the GM might have to do some extra work to make sure that that's clear. You need to go to the Scythe and Sheaf. Make sure that that comes out. Whatever your players decide to do, make sure that that comes out quite clearly. If the players have proof, they can get support from either the Knights or the Bishop, or potentially both, in the raid. As they're making their way there, Turim will also find them and insist on joining the raid so that he can repay the cult for the attack that took his leg. I may have meant, forgot to mention, but Turim uh, has a peg leg and he blames the cult for taking it years ago. But he will join the party regardless of what the players say or do. There's no way that you can keep him out because he's an important plot point. So inside the inn, the innkeeper and a couple of guards are kind of quickly scared away. And you go down into the basement, which leads to a secret temple. There's mostly commoners worshipping here, but there's also Dirac Malkinex, who is the high priestess, along with the hand and the eye, the creatures, uh, here, uh, kind of at the front uh, near the altar. Vecna, or Halmader, is also present, but he's currently hiding his face, so nobody knows. But as the party arrives into the back of the temple, Vecna is Halmader is just being introduced as Vecna, to the followers. The scenario points out, it says, the party should be worried about this because they've experienced what Vecna just did to the Circle of Eight. And basically, once the characters arrive and Vecna is, introdu Vecna is introduced, a battle will kind of break out. Vecna, Halmater, will let his uh, minions kind of do the fighting, but at some appropriate point, at some dramatic point during the, the battle, have Turim make his way towards Vecna, Halmater. And Vecna, Halmater, will try to use the powers of the hand and the eye, the artifacts, not the creatures. He will try to use them against Turim. But, of course, they are useless because Turim is Vecna. His hand and his eyes can't be used against him. Now, this is a, a little bit, it's all very confusing, but one thing that I would say would really help it is if the party have already seen the hand and the eye in action, maybe striking down some of the guards who are with them, uh, then this will be much more impactful. Maybe they are, uh, for a second, they're worried about Turim going up against this guy who's just going to use Finger of Death on Turim and he'll be, you know, killed instantly. 
and then there's some kind of pause in them when they realize that you know the hand isn't working but anyway Turim will rip off the hand and rip out the eye uh, the artifacts again not the creatures he'll rip them from Halmatter and without the sustaining Halmatter Halmatter will crumble into dust and he's gone and he's dead Turim then transforms into Vecna calling out that he is the true whispered one at this stage there's a lot of confusion but the fighting kind of stops and Vecna the real Vecna now, will thank the party for their help, and he makes an emotion as if he's going to kill them, but then he pauses and tells them to meet him at Tovag Baragu. After this, Vecna teleports away, and this should kind of end the scene. I would say have Dirac Malkinex, the high priestess, kind of spirit away herself and the hand and the eye, the creatures, those guys are gone until later. And then the rest of the cultists, mostly commoners, are kind of just running away at this stage. So as much as that seemed like it might have been the climax, we're quite a bit away from the climax for the moment. The party have to learn about uh, Tovag Baridu, but it's not that hard to find, even though it's not common knowledge. But as you're gathering information and before you go, the players will get visions, essentially forcing them to go to Osnabrolt, if they haven't already, in order to find a powerful sword that will help them. So you have to, basically you have to go to Osnabrolt, is, is what the scenario says. There are some random encounters on your way there, but basically you'll arrive at the gnome village, and you have to convince them of your good intent. And then there's a weird preliminary test with a baby bird, where you have to act in the right way. They, they've, they say, we found this baby bird, and they just kind of hand it off to you, and you have to and you have to deal with it in the right way or else you know so if you yeah if you fail the test you can't get the sword it's not possible for you to get the sword uh, if you pass the test you then you can go for the real trial in the real trial you will first fast for a full day 24 hours and then go into a sweat lodge and make a constitution check every hour for 14 hours failing once means you will start to get sick and start hallucinating which should probably mean an additional penalty for your constitution, along with the fact that you've been fasting for 24 hours. If you fail a constitution check twice, you will pass out and you're removed from the lodge and you fail the test. All you need is one person to pass from your party. Now, looking at the maths on this, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to get it. Uh, the odds of passing 13 constitution rolls, allowing for one failure, so 13 success and one failure and ignoring any penalties from that failure are really minuscule if your con is 15 you've got a two percent chance of it if you've got 18 con you've only got a 25 percent chance uh, 19 will get you there about half the time and 20 will be a guarantee so if you have constitution of 20 you'll be fine unless there's penalties in which case the chances go down of course but the players also don't know when it's going to end. So, you know, 14 rolls in a row can seem kind of arbitrary. If you do pass the test, however, then you'll be given a new name based on any hallucinations that you had during the experience. And you'll become an honorary gnome of the Osnabrolt clan. You're brought into a temple and you have to dig the sword out. But once the sword is exposed even a little bit, it flies up out of the air and it's just hanging there waiting for you to take it. The first person who touches it will be the owner and will immediately lose 2d20 hit points. This will only happen the very first time that you touch it, uh, when you're taking ownership. Uh, after that, you can touch it freely, no penalty, although you, you don't know that. The sword has many magical properties, uh, some of which you know immediately upon touching it and taking ownership, and some you have to learn as you go through trial and error. Basically, this is great news for the gnomes who have been tasked with protecting this sword for a long time. And you know, it's, it's caused their crops to wither even though they've become good fighters. But basically they think this is great, you know, we'll be all back to normal now. So there's a big celebration, a big feast, but the, and they won't let you, they will not let you leave early. Like it's written in the scenario, you can't leave early. Now probably you want to stay after the fasting anyway, but you know, Fekna is also waiting for you. But there are also spies of Eos watching. Eos is the evil god, who is the only god who's actually present on Oerth. Uh, 
most of the other gods have their avatars on Earth instead. So, uh, Eos has been watching Vecna's growing power and worrying about it. So, his priests are here to get the sword, which they think will help in the fight against Vecna. It won't. If the priests who now attack, if they manage to get the sword, they will escape quickly. They don't really want to kill the gnomes or the party, they just want the sword. If the priests seem to be losing, they will try to strike a deal with the party, which is an alliance between them until Vecna is taken down. You can take this if you want. It's a genuine offer. They, they will work with you until Vecna is taken down. But as soon as Vecna, as soon as Vecna is, is down, if that happens, they'll turn on you like that. You know, they're evil cult. So now, with that out of the way, you need to go to Tovak Baragu. Teleportation is the best means, but there is also powerful magic in the area. So the closest you can get is about 2d6 miles away from it. Uh, despite warnings you read about the nomadic people who protect the sacred area, they don't seem to be anywhere around. But as you get closer, you see that the nomadic people are starting to gather around well, in a wide distance around Tovag Baragu. They won't interfere with you at all, though. And as you get closer, you can see a figure in the middle of the stone circle moving around and doing something. Tovag Baragu is a little bit like Stonehenge. The character moving is clearly Vecna, but he's not bothered with you and he won't react to the party unless until they reach the center area of the circle or if they start to attack him. Uh, Vecna is very busy and casting a lot of magic to open doors, various doors within the standing stones, which open up to other planes and other times. So once you get the attention of Vecna, he will offer you a chance for any one of you in the party to become his new right hand. All you have to do is kill your fellow party members. So if any of the party does that, then he'll be happy that will end the scenario and Vecna will have won. But assuming that doesn't happen, he will cast the whole party through one of the open portals, telling them to join Cass in hell. That's a very important line. So the party now finds themselves on the negative plane of Ash and somehow, well, in a special pocket within that a plane. Somehow you have to figure out a way to defeat Vecna. And the only one who has ever defeated Vecna was Cass. So this plane or this space within the plane is Vecna's private prison and it's in, well, the main part of it is in the shape of a skull. And this is called Citadel Cavidius. There are lots of hopeless people here and the players are advised or were told several times to abandon all hope as they enter. But eventually, as they look around, they can find Cass, who is a vampire now. And he has absolutely no desire to help them and tells them that escape is impossible. If he finds out that they have his sword, he will demand to have it back. If the party give it to him, he will immediately use the sword's power to plane shift out of there without the players. And they'll be basically stranded there. You have to get information from him before handing the sword over. But there's not really much hint at this either. But even once you once you get the information from him is that his revelation is that he never really defeated Vecna. The sword of Cass is useless within 60 feet of Vecna. It just loses all of its power. He has no real information from them other than saying that they have to find something on Oerth which is as powerful as Vecna. And at this point, Cass points out that this must be Eus, the evil god. I'm not sure how Cass knows that, though, as he's been trapped here for centuries or possibly millennia. But, you know, that's that's the big revelation. You Somehow you have to get Eus on your side. So, as I mentioned before, Vecna is creating a boundary between the gods and Oerth so that he can become the only god and gain all the worshippers and power that goes with that. I'm not sure how Cass knows this either. I think Cass knows it, but I'm not sure how. The players have been told that escape is impossible and to give up all hope once they enter here. But escape is not impossible. There's a few options. You can just return through the gate. It'll bring you back to Tolvag Baragu. Or you can use a plane shift spells. Or you can use the Sword of Cass, which has plane shift in it. It doesn't make sense that everyone is completely trapped here if escape is possible. Instead, what I suggest is because Vecna is so focused on these powerful magical spells that he's casting at Tovag Baragu, 
that that is causing temporary weakenings on the protections in Citadel Cavidius. And this is probably the only chance to escape. To, you know, explain this or to, to illustrate this, you can show intermittent signs of, you know, the, the protections weakening. And so the timing of the escape will have to be perfect as well. That also means that, you know, Cass can't just disappear like a jerk immediately. Now, what is Vecna doing? He's trying to open a portal to his original time one day after his fight with Cass so that then he can get all of his former worshippers, you know, for them it's just the next day, to come through the portal to O-Earth, to, to Tovag Baragu in the present time, and more worshippers will give him more power. So, let's say you've made it back to Tovag Baragu. Hopefully you have, because that's what the story wants you to do. If Cass is with you here, he's absolutely no help. It's night time now, but as a vampire, he will need to find shelter before it's light. But mostly he just wants to steer clear of Vecna completely. So he will just run away as quickly as possible or escape through one of the other portals. So the main idea is for the players to uh, summon the evil god Eus. If the priest of Eus is with them uh, after the attack at Osnabrolt, he can easily summon the god, or else if any of the other players have the ability to do that. So this will lead to Eus and Vecna battling each other. The DM is encouraged to describe this cinematically and dramatically, because two gods fighting is no place for the, I think, is it 14th level, 14th level players in this? So, you know, they can't really get involved. At first, during the battle, it seems that Eus is winning, but as more and more worshippers come through the gate that Vecna has, has created, uh, Vecna is growing in, more, in power, and Vecna is also a better strategist, and he's smarter than Eus. So the players, now it's their time to get involved. They need to stop more people from entering from the past. 20 of them are already through, and five more come each round. So pretty quickly, the players will realize that uh, the fight is futile unless they can damage or close the gateway. But they're not powerful enough to do this. So they have to draw Eus's attention to this gate. And then he can cast a powerful spell at the gate, closing it and damaging Tovag Baragu permanently. Vecna is pretty mad about this, not only because it stops his growing power, but it was also, this was one of the key factors in blocking the other gods from Oerth. So from this point forward, the wards start weakening and priest powers start to come back. The scenario decides that the players should realize that there's no good outcome from them here. Either way, if, if either of the gods win, then there'll at, be at least one evil, angry god left and he'll likely be on the destruction path. I'm not 100% sure I agree with this. You know, EUs maybe might spare them. But anyway, that's that's what the scenario, you know, insists. So <laughs> the solution is you have to try to push both of the gods through one of the portals. And now the, the main idea here is to wait until they're actually weakened from battle with each other. But even then, it seems like a big ask. And the whole scenario or the whole finale here is showing you you're not powerful enough to you know get involved with fighting with the god but then it's saying oh but you have to so anyway <laughs> somehow you have to try and force both of the gods through a portal and if you do it the portal will essentially be closed immediately after that maybe by the gods or maybe that's just a reaction to when a god travel, travels through a portal. It's not really explained here. It just kind of happens. And that, you know, problem solved. Even though the, the party went through the portal to Tovak Bar or to um, Citadel Cavidius, and then they could have potentially just come right back. For some reason, once Vecna or Eus go through, that breaks everything. And this is basically the end of the, the campaign. Uh, you've probably made enemies of both Vecna and Eus, and their cults will likely be out to make life difficult for you. On the other hand, the rest of the gods will look kindly on you and may even give you some gifts from the gods, and several of them are suggested here. If Vecna wins, then all of Oerth is in for a pretty bad time, 
but it says that, you know, this can lead to lots of adventuring hooks for the future, but nothing is really given. And that's the adventure. So uh, what do I think? Well, as a story, it's not too bad. Although there are still a few parts that don't quite make sense. As a campaign for RPGs, though, it's pretty bad. I like that the history of Vecna and Cass was fleshed out as before this, they were only artifacts, um, you know, in the past. However, there's so much railroading in it. Now, there's a big difference between linear storytelling and railroading. And when you've got some kind of mystery, you know, like the secret cult or something, it's, it's quite natural to have linear storytelling. But this scenario is all about railroading. There's basically no other way for the story to turn out rather than what's written here. The very start of the scenario is probably a waste of time. For the players to learn the character sheets for really powerful spellcasters will take some time, and they only get to play as them for a little bit. What you could do instead is have a few scenarios or maybe solo missions with each player playing their character as powerful spellcasters, and then they could go up against powerful foes and, you know, help the, the world of Greyhawk. Like, you know, it could be fun for someone to go in as one of the powerful spellcasters and, you know, take on, solo take on, a you know, a dragon, something like that. And then, you know, that character continues on into this campaign. And then fully understanding how powerful those characters are and then having their asses handed to them by Vecna Halmadar, that would be a little bit more impactful. Or, and I think this is the better option, is the players could just play their original characters or the secondary characters in this, and they could find the deceased bodies of the Circle of Eight, and then they could be horrified that there could be anything so powerful as to kill all of the members of the Circle of Eight. Even killing one would be amazing, but killing them all, that that should be enough horror without having actually lived through it and, you know, knowing that it's Vecna. There could be hints about hands and eyes in the aftermath of this, but the way it's played out is your super powerful spellcasters, then you die, and then your new character have to take on the role of much, much, much weaker characters and try to solve the problem that your superiors were too weak for doesn't really make a lot of sense and the scenario really forces you to get to well to try to get the sword of Cass implying that it's so important but it's really difficult to get it through the trials as written you know how you deal with the bird could just rule you out immediately even if you get past that you know making 14 well 13 out of 14 successful constitution rolls is, is it's tough and even if you do get it, it could kill you when you first touch it. Probably it won't. But even after that, it might be stolen by the priests of EUs like immediately from you. And even after that, it's completely useless if you try to use it against Vecna. And even after that, you're supposed to use it to bribe Cass. And if you give it to him, he will plane shift out of there without telling you anything. And even if you get the information from him first, he doesn't have any information. So, <laughs> like, the Sword of Cass is possibly a useful item, you know, going forward. It's 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 a good sword, and it has a lot of good role-playing uh, abilities to it, but it just doesn't, like, it's really forced in here with, without a proper reason. Again, the idea of Citadel Cavidius is cool, but it doesn't make sense as written as well. The players are told there's no escape, there's no hope, this is a place full of despair, thousands of tortured souls have been here for centuries or millennia, but you can just plane shift out of there. Yeah, I know plane shift isn't you know the most common spell, but have no magic users been imprisoned here? And when Tolvag Baragu's portal opens up, I know, I know it's a little bit far away, but, like, does nobody think just to rush through there? Maybe, like, their hope has, their hope and their spirit really have been crushed after centuries living here, but the first time in centuries that uh, your chance of escape seems pretty tempting, but everyone's kind of ignoring it. So the whole reason for getting the sword is to use it as a bargaining chip with Cass, 
but he really can't help except to tell you to find another god. But it doesn't make sense that he has what knowledge he does have on the current state of Oerth. Then you get to the finale where you're just bystanders in a battle of gods and the god you're rooting for will lose unless you tell him, hey, you know, stop his followers from coming through. They're making him more powerful. You know, it seem, kind of makes him seem like an idiot. And then you have to try to push both gods through a portal and somehow this kind of destroys all the magic and the portals and Tovag Baragu. It's just kind of, it's problem solved. Now, the first climax where Turim destroys Halmater, that was a decent dramatic point. But I think if I were making this scenario from scratch, I would probably have had that earlier in the scenario. Because so, it's, it's really, it's like a false climax. And then the rest of it after that is, is pretty messy. But I probably would have cut out a lot of the earlier mess in the scenario and had that Turum, well, Vecna replaces Halmater a little bit earlier on. And then Vecna will go on working on his plans in the background. He kind of disappears for a while and starts working on his big plan. And then the players will maybe will have different missions trying to thwart his plans. And as they do, they're leveling up, getting up to high levels, finally leading to a powerful showdown between them and Vecna. But where the PCs have actual agency in the fight, it's going to be a tough fight and they might die, but they're involved in it. There's also a couple of precedents uh, for what I'm about to say in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Um, minor spoilers coming up for Tyranny of Dragons and Storm King's Thunder. So just stop listening for about 30 seconds. Um, in Tyranny of Dragons, depending on how many masks the players can prevent the cult from getting, then Tiamat will be summoned in less powerful forms. So if you get, or do you need to get more masks? Either way, that will affect how powerful the big bad is. And in Storm King Thunder, the players can get potions of giant size, or giant strength, I can't remember, for in preparation of their final battle for Storm King's Thunder. So something like that maybe would give the players some kind of hope, um, but it should always still be a very tough battle. But the way that it's set up, there's no way for the players to be powerful enough to take down Vecna. And they're just kind of idly sitting by while, you know, the dungeon master is talking to himself. So this campaign does have some good elements, but it wouldn't really hold up well these days. I think it works best when the GM or the DM is doing a lot of extra work behind the scenes, like kind of fixing this up for their party. If you check around online, there are several kind of re relatively recent reviews of it, and none of, none of them are kind or positive. But however weak this first entry was, it was the beginning of The Legend of Vecna, which has grown a lot and is culminating in this upcoming campaign that I hope, I hope, will do more justice to the Lich Legend. All right, so that is going to do it for today. The next video in the series will bring us to the mists of Ravenloft, but not Ravenloft itself, in Vecna Reborn. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you all next time. Bye!